Almighty God, we give you praise for this day and for bringing us to this point in this program. Father, take the praise in Jesus' name. You are the one who want to see. You are the one who want to hear. Lord, please do just this in the name of Jesus. Thank you, faithful Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. I thank God for the privilege I have to bring God's word to this house this evening at this year's Congress. As we very well know, a broad theme for the year is sharp threshing instruments. And I sought the face of God as per what he wants me to speak on. And it took me a long, long while because all manner of things were running through my mind. And God led me into a dealing I had some time back and they said, this is exactly what he wants me to share with the house. So what I'm speaking on is healing for the wounded. Healing for the wounded. It is one thing for the instrument to be sharp. Then it's a different ball game altogether for the instrument to become blunt. It is one thing for the instrument to be active. It is a different ball game altogether for the instrument to now become inactive. So it is one thing for a soldier to be alive and active on the battleground. Then it's a serious matter when that soldier is wounded. So some of us have operated on the level of sharpness at a point in time. But at the moment now, we are blunt, we are wounded, we are inactive. So God is bringing this word to us. As a matter of fact, to every one of us. Healing for the wounded. I remember when I was in the secondary school, of course, talking of many decades ago now, we offered mathematics. And mathematics, as for many students like me, was one very, very stubborn subject. As a matter of fact, a lot of students hate mathematics. And I know I have some co-travelers in the house like that. Uh-huh. <laughs> so we offered mathematics. I'm talking of the days of Form 1 to Form 5, not GS1 to GS3, SS1 to SS3. Form 1 to Form 5. The secondary school ended in Form 5 then. So when we got to Form 3, as much as I battled with mathematics in Form 1 to Form 3, they now introduced another mathematics they called Add Maths. That was what they called it. When they told us you'll now be offering Hard Maths, what came to my hearing was H-A-R-D. It was a long time before I knew it was additional mathematics that they shortened to Add Maths. All I had was hard maths. And I loved the thing with me that the ordinary soft mathematics I did not understand. I labored to understand. Now in Form 3, you are bringing hard maths. We are in it together. And lo and behold, when they began the hard maths, it turned out to be truly hard. Because everything they were teaching us were just like uh, Greek to me. Uh, but as much as Admas was, we had a classmate. I will leave the name now. The classmate was very, very brilliant. He understood everything our teacher taught us in Admas. Everything. Such that he became a second teacher to students like him. Whenever our teacher left, after teaching each class, we would run to this young man and he would break everything down to us very brilliant young man. He was equally good in other subjects. And we as fellow students surrendered amongst ourselves that if none of us would amount to anything in the future that this young man was going to amount to something big in life because he was just very brilliant. Lo and behold, we sat for a while when the results came out as a matter of fact, he cleared everything. 
He cleared everything, including that ad mats. And at my own first sitting, I'm not proud to tell you what I scored. But I had a second sitting when I took GCE again and was able to score A3 in mathematics. That one is good enough to announce, Abi. <laughs> but this man cleared everything at the first sitting. Everything. We parted ways years after. I'm talking of many years ago now when it was roughly 25 years after we had left school. Talking of many years ago now. My secretary... Uh, walked into the office and told me I had a visitor. Mentioned the name. The name did not click until the visitor came in. Then I saw before me was that young man, my old schoolmate. But this time something had happened. His very appearance showed that something was wrong. The odor that emanated from his body showed something was wrong, like one who had not bathed for days. When he opened his mouth, I received a confirmation that something was wrong. Because his words were not coherent. He had a mental problem. I'm saying this with sorrow and sadness in my heart. I'm only making a point. And then when he spoke to me, he said, Mike, can't you recognize me? I said, of course I can now. What can I do for you? And he told me that he had come. To beg for money to buy a wall clock to put in his house. And when he went on to talk, I knew he did not even need a wall clock. The man was no longer all right. And then the thing struck in my heart that his destiny had been wounded. He started sharp, but then his destiny got injured. Please, can you stand and pray like somebody who is annoyed? That every power that is out, hey, to tamper with my vision and destiny. Ah, I arrest you this night in the name of Jesus. Pray that prayer like somebody who is annoyed. Every power commissioned by hell, hey, to fight against my sharpness, you will not prosper in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord, open your mouth and pray that prayer. Father. Let your power be upon me, my life, my ministry, my destiny. Don't allow any power contrary to yours. Hey, hey, to prosper upon my life in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we prayed. Amen. God bless you. Be seated. I got this to make an illustration. You can see this. This plain glass or plastic in my hand. Let's assume this is what God sent you to the world with. And then God in his benevolent love began with you, with your clear destiny, your clear vision, clear purpose for your life. Of course, not full. But then God is still working on you to bring you to the place he has proposed for you. But then along the way you discover that the enemy comes. And what does he do? The enemy pours this into that clear destiny. And you see everything is now colored. Everything is now distorted, no longer as intended from creation. This is what happens when a soldier is wounded. The vision is no longer clear. When I look through, I can no longer see you. Distorted, blurry, obscure. We'll come back to this in a short while, but just keep this at the back of your heart. This is what happens when a soldier is no longer sharp. When a minister is no longer sharp, when a child of God is no longer sharp, when a husband is no longer sharp, when a wife is no longer sharp, when a family is no longer sharp, when a ministry is no longer sharp, this is the picture we have in our hand here. But it did not begin this way. So we'll be using the illustration of a soldier in the course of this teaching. 
Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. There the Bible says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. So here we are likened to soldiers. At salvation, beloved, every Christian is automatically enlisted into God's army. So this is not a matter of choice or a matter of volunteering. When you become born again, you are automatically enlisted into God's army. Meaning, as a member of that army, you are a soldier, a soldier of Christ. But then you begin to wonder, who is a soldier? I will be using the circular description of a soldier to draw out some characteristics of Christian soldiers. We are going somewhere. I just enjoy you listening attentively and allow the Spirit of God to expand this teaching in your ears. What are the characteristics of a soldier? Number one, a soldier does not entangle himself with the affairs of this life. Why? To avoid undue mingling with civilians. This is why soldiers are usually kept where? Where are they kept? Army barracks. This is where they live. It is essentially not to allow them to mingle unduly with civilians. This is why when they come out to the public and they want to refer to an average civilian, they call you a bloody civilian. In the same way, as Christian soldiers, we are not to mingle with worldliness. Little wonder the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, see the Lord. So as a soldier, you are to come out from among them. There should be a marked difference between you and the world. Time will not permit me to expatiate more on this because where we are going is fairly far. Number two characteristic is that a soldier wears a uniform. He puts on a uniform. Armies of nations are known by their uniforms and by their insignia. The insignia is that which you find on the uh, shoulder here and the one you find in the front of the beret. So you know the armies of different nations by their insignia and their uniforms. So when a person becomes a Christian soldier, he also puts off the garment spotted by the flesh. There should be a difference. The garment that is spotted by the flesh will no longer be found on you. Romans 13, 14 puts it clearly. But put it on the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you become a Christian soldier, what you are expected to put on is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible goes on to say, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So you put on a uniform and what you have to put on according to this scripture is Christ. So what we see in you as a Christian soldier as a uniform is Christ. If you are still here, can you say amen? amen. Number three, he trains. He trains. There is a training for Christian soldier. There is a time of learning how to be efficient and effective as a secular soldier the same thing is true for a Christian soldier. Second Peter from chapter 1 from verse 5 to verse 10. You must be trained. You receive requisite training for you to be an effective Christian soldier. I want to draw an illustration from the U.S. Army. We have the regular army. We have the navy. And within the navy, you have the ones they call the marines. The marines are esteemed more than the navy under which they are. And are far more esteemed, even more than the regular army. Why? By virtue of the special training they receive. Very vigorous training. They undergo 12, I mean 13 weeks of training. The first week of training is what they call the preparation stage. And then the next one is what they call the initial strength test, IST. During this time, they have to do certain number of push-ups and they do certain number of pull-ups. 
So if you can't get to the standard, you don't qualify for the other training. During this time, they call something a plank pose, where you stay on your elbows with your chest not touching the ground for a long period of time. If you come down before the stipulated time, you are not qualified to go on for the next set of training. Then you have the 1.5 mile race within a stipulated time. If you don't complete that race, within that time, you are not qualified. This is just to prepare you. The initial strength test. Then they have the armed service vocational aptitude battery test. This is to trust your mental acumen. Multiple choice questions within a short time. And you must answer so many correctly before you qualify. Before you enter into the Marines. So they have basic learning of physical and mental training. Raffle training, field training. And the 13 weeks round off with what they call the boot camp. This boot camp is usually the final three days of physical test. As a matter of fact, you know what they call their test? They say their training is extremely challenging. That's the way they qualify it. Extremely challenging. During the boot camp, they will not be allowed to eat for some days. And then they come out to do what they call the matching with loaded backpacks. Their backpacks are loaded with heavy materials. And they march some kilometers with that. No food, no water. Fasting for days. You break down along the way, they pull you out. And they crawl through the mud, carrying load. They equally carry heavy ammunition. And with this, they run through simulated battlefields. All without food and without rest. That's the Marine Corps for you. Why? So that they can get the very best. Beloved, as a soldier of Christ, you equally go through trainings. Unfortunately, some of us pull out in the course of our trainings. We fall off. There are some certain hardships that God allows into your life. Mark my words. Why? For you to receive the needed training. Remember Saul that became Paul. He asked God, what will you have me do? And God gave him a mandate of what he was going to do from, the, from day one. I remember what God told Ananias, to whom Paul was sent. God said to Ananias, I am sending Saul, that is now Paul, that is now a convert for me, a disciple for me. I'm sending him to you. And you know what God went on to tell Ananias? I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name. In other words, Ananias said, no problem, daddy. Let him come to my school of training. What is the syllabus? The syllabus is this. Teach him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So when Paul entered the class the first day, the class of Ananias, he told him, you are welcome to this class. This is the class of SST. That is Suffering Smiling Training. 001. This is the course we are beginning with. And this is the course you keep repeating to the end of your training. Because God told me to train you on how great things you must suffer. If it were to be a lot of us, that would be the last day we'll enter that kind of class. Training! Because you have been taught that all shall be well when we become born again. It will begin to shine and it will be happy ever after. But a lot of us do not want to hear anything that sounds like suffering. Little wonder we don't last in ministry. And I began to hear that even the normal confession, the normal declaration, that innocent declaration that we used to hear at wedding ceremonies have changed now. For better, for worse. It has been changed to for better, for best. No, 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 not in this church, man. No, we don't confess negativity here. No, don't say that, dear. For better, for best. And when they come there into the church, I mean, to the marriage, I begin to see things that are appearing like worse, even bad, not yet worse. They run away. My pastor never told me this. But then the curriculum is not complete. 
how great things he must suffer. You know the way we change that song given. Today, oh, I will lift up my voice in praise. All I know, you are always there for me. Almighty God, you are my all in all. No matter what I face, when success comes my way, I will praise the Lord. Was that the original song? What was it? Uh -huh. Those are the new lecturers in the school. And when they tell me that they will have old school Christians, new school Christians, I tell people there is nothing like old school, new school. It's still the same school. It is the bad lecturers that came to spoil the normal school that we now have a disparity. The school is the same. But now the lecture they are giving us is just very different. And I keep asking, uh -uh. When success comes my way, I will praise the Lord. Who is that person who will not praise the Lord when success comes? Who? Who will not praise the Lord normally? So some of the things you are passing through, beloved, are part of the training as a soldier. Tarry, remain there. Stay there. Number four, he submits to and pleases his commander. The soldier submits to and pleases his commander. The most important attributes of soldiers are loyalty and obedience. What did I call it? Loyalty and what? Obedience. This is the number one attribute. When you are under a commander, you are bound to obey that commander. There are the cliche in the army. They say, obey the what? The last command. Whatever the commandant tells you to do, you do it. How many of us can say, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. If it comes to dying, so be it. How many of us can say that? What you need as a characteristic of a good soldier, loyalty and obedience. Whatever is yet unto you, do it. You remember Jesus' mother, when he told the son that they had no wine, what did Jesus say? Mother, what do I have to do with you? What did the mother say? Nothing more. She only went back to the disciples knowing that the miracle had happened already. I know my son. Ma, what did he say? Don't worry. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. So all you need is obedience. As a soldier of Christ, as a minister of God, beloved, you must learn obedience. His command must be the last order. There can be varying ideas here and there. But whatever is said unto you, that you do as a soldier of Christ. Number five. This one, you may not like it, but it is there. He suffers. He suffers. Good soldiers endure much suffering. Christian soldiers must be ready to endure the same. Remember Hebrews 5, 8 says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. He there is referring to our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So sorry, suffering is part of the syllabus. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ, as we saw earlier in 2 Timothy 2, 3. Number six, he sacrifices. Sacrifices. Good soldiers sacrifice any and everything. He sacrifices for the sake of the master. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of whom? Of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, only and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Sacrifices. You must be willing to sacrifice. That's Romans 12, 1. You must be willing to sacrifice you sacrifice your comfort, you sacrifice your possession, you sacrifice your time. I don't have enough time to share my story with you, but I think I will share this bit with you. That when I finished my first degree, I entered for my second degree in analytical chemistry, a master's in chemistry, specializing in environmentals. And towards the end of the course, the Lord hijacked everything in my hand and told me, you leave everything, everything, and come and serve me full time. 
and the Abiyo chairman was recounting December 5 to 6, 1996, in uh, Ibadan. I was at that conference, and I was lodged in Government House Charlie, Charlie 376 or thereabout. And in the night, God came visiting. During my personal devotion, I was singing songs of praise. Amen, 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 amen. I didn't know how the song turned to I surrender all. I surrender all. And I wanted to switch back to my normal worship. The next thing that would come was All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Before I knew, I went to Yoruba singing. Mufi bubure fun pata pata laiku ibagbo miro mo that is I leave everything without anything behind my whole faith is attached to the King of Kings the Son of God so I was singing songs of surrender then I kept quiet to begin to pray God did not allow me to pray He was the one who spoke He said Son I've been telling you you serve me full time the time has come. You leave everything. You have been pursuing academics, everything. And you serve me full time. And honestly, I thought it was a demonic spirit. Because I'd, I was well read. I had not earned a single kobo with any of my certificates, at least to recompense my parents. Not one naira. And just a few months before that, I went for an interview in a reputable organization in Lori. And they told me they would get back to me. That was a few months before December 1996. And lo and behold, I had that visitation December 1996. And I said, God, now that you have spoken, when should I start this full time you are talking about? He said he was going to tell me that I should continue operating at that level. And I was so happy, I thought it was going to be very, very long. Lo and behold, a letter came. And the letter was from that organization. That was 1997. Towards the end of January, they said I had gotten an appointment with that reputable organization. And I was so excited that at least I will earn some money to recompense my parents before we go into that full time that uh, God was speaking about. And I looked at the letter. I saw February 1, 1997 as a day of assumption of duty. Then God spoke right there. He said, son, you have to assume duty full time. February 1, 1997. Why now? Why? Why now was the question. Why did you allow me to go to school and get all these certificates? He said that no one will say in the future that you are serving me full time because you could not go to school. Okay. Why did you allow me to go through the stress of interview, application and everything? Only for me to receive the letter you said full time now. He said that no one will say you are jobless. That's why you are serving me. So keep the certificate somewhere. And begin to serve me. And I let go. 1997 till date. I've even lost count of the number of years. By God's grace. You want to clap for Jesus? Go ahead. Go ahead. To the glory of God. By God's grace. I have not had. And I'm not going to have. A single time of regret. No regret. Not for once. For ever going into a full time ministry. By God's grace. I don't envy any man. No matter what you do, you are a successful banker, you are a successful oil dealer, whatever. Have not envied any human because God has just been faithful. But it began with a sacrifice. So as a soldier of Christ, his brother Mike calling me to sacrifice my job, sacrifice. No, you know the point at which God wants your own sacrifice. I only shared mine. But a good soldier is one who is ready to sacrifice any and everything for the cause. Of the master of the commander number seven he fights the enemy he fights the enemy soldiers engage in combats with their enemies you know that of course he fights the enemy the christian soldier must also be ready to fight the enemy Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. You know that scripture very well, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickednesses in high places. So these are the ones we wage war against, not any human anywhere. So we are constantly in a battle against principalities and powers. So you must be ready to fight. 
for the kingdom as a soldier. You take your place in authority. Take your place in authority. Time will not permit me to share testimonies of many, many encounters with demonic forces, with demonic entities. As a soldier, you must be ready to stand in the place of fighting for the sake of the kingdom. Of course, you know what I'm saying? You are not fighting against any human anywhere, but against principalities and powers. So we can go on and on telling us about the characteristics of good soldiers. But let's quickly go on to this. Why Christian soldiers get wounded? This is where we are going to gradually. Why do they get wounded? How do they get wounded? Number one thing that brings about an injury to a soldier is breaking ranks. Breaking ranks. R-A-N-K-S. Breaking ranks. Please come four brothers or with sisters come to the stage here quickly. Just four. Quickly. Four. Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right. I have three here. Yes. Come. Come. Okay. Come. Okay. Please. All of you. Yeah. You're not more. You are not too many. Be on the queue. The person at the back here. Then straight. Be on the queue. Yeah. In front. In front. In front. Yes. Very good. Please let there be space in between you. Right, thank you. This you are saying is a rank in the military. It is a rank in the military. So when you march, you march in a rank. This is why we enjoy the beauty of soldiers marching. They march in a rank. Their hands go up the same time. Their legs go up the same time. And they are in a single file. So my brother. Okay you yes. Please step to the right. Now. What my brother has just done. Is breaking rank. So when he breaks rank like this. He's off the line. And he's no longer in line. In the military. He has committed a big offense. Very very big one. Because. The military is a disciplined force. So this is what we mean by breaking rank. Publicly stepping out of order. Publicly disagreeing with laid down rules. Publicly renouncing the, 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 the stated, I mean the statement of order in a group. This is what breaking rank means. So he may be marching so well here. But in as much as he's not in rank, then he's not doing the correct thing. God bless you, brethren. You may return to your seat. Thank you. So I brought this illustration for us to have a clear picture. As a soldier of Christ, when you break rank, then there is trouble. When you step out, you step out into disorder. That is just it. And the end result is that such will be wounded. In football, you know, as a good striker, if you are in rank, you are expected to be in front, hitting the ball, so that you can end up scoring for your team. Now, let me ask you, what will happen if a striker is converted to become a goalkeeper emergency? Do you know there is likely to be a big calamity? Am I correct? Because when they hit the ball towards the goal, and the thing is within a place where he could use his hand to catch it. The spirit of the striker in him will tell him, don't touch, don't touch. He will try to head and the ball will enter. Is that not it? Because he has broken rank, he's not in this normal position. Reverse it now. If a goalkeeper is converted to a striker, emergency. And just then they tell him, go into the box, we have a corner kick. And they kick the ball as a striker. What is he supposed to do? Head the ball or find a way to kick the ball? What will the goalkeeper in him tell him to do? He will catch the ball. Why? He's out of rank. So as a Christian soldier, when you break ranks, you begin to misbehave. It's easy for me to say in Yoruba, what we come in is, that is, you're not going to know how to do them again. 
The things where you sabi do, you don't care where problem, no day before you come begin the struggle, you see, say thing though they flow again. When you break ranks, what used to be easy, you find them difficult now. You are wounded. You may be the fastest runner in an athletic race. If you step out of the track, there are usually eight tracks in the standard stadium. When you step out of all eight tracks and you come to the side, and they say on your mask, get, said, go. And you begin to run, guru, 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 guru. And you get to the end before every other person. You still will not win the prize because you ran out of rank. So when you break ranks, you enter into disorder. There is no prize for that. No reward for that. Can I pray for you? You will not labor in vain. Oh, I thought the amen would be bigger than that. You remember Dinah, the daughter of Leah? The Bible says so far in Genesis 34 verse 1, I read, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughter of the land. To see the daughter of the land. Unfortunately, she did not only see, she was also seen. Verse 2 goes on to say, And when Shechem, the son of Amma, the Evite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. So she did not only see, she ended up being seen. So beloved, as a drama minister, when you begin to stretch your neck, what are they doing over there? Can I see? And you begin to get filled up with the passion of copying everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, of what is happening on the other side, so that your movie can become acceptable. Beloved, you are breaking ranks. You will get injured. It is not everything that can be brought in. It's not everything that can be borrowed. You agree with me? But a lot are so passionate about that. We want to make it real. Our movies must get to Netflix by all means. I spoke with somebody there. They said our movies are too moral. It's too pious. Can't we introduce a little pecking and things like that? Even if you can't do real, real nudity, just put a little silhouette. We don't see the real character. Shoot it creatively. Let's just see the shape of the woman there. You say, man, this is great. This is a great idea. You begin to borrow little by little. Beloved, you are breaking ranks. You know like Diana what you are doing? You want to see. But she ended up being seen. When you peep to see, beloved, you end up being seen by the devil and you become a target. Breaking ranks. Demas equally did the same. For Demas had forsaken me, haven't loved this present world, and is departed into Thessalonica. I can't go into exposing that. But Demas broke ranks. He left the disciples and went off. When your mother's soup is no longer sweet enough, you may end up taking poison in your enemy's house. And I tell you, my mother's soup was the sweetest she, till she passed on. Just like my wife's soup is still the sweetest till tomorrow. Do you agree with me? You know, some women are so blessed. When I have discovered, when my mother, pray, my wife prepares soup with little money, the soup ends up being sweeter. Abby? So I want to do a research on that to find out how it is happening like that. What am I driving at? No matter what she cooks, I don't need to go out to try to see Stay there. Stay in your place of assignment. Don't break ranks, beloved. Don't break ranks. They may look the same, but they are not the same. If I ask you in science, petrol, is it solid or liquid? Petrol. Is it solid or liquid? Water, is it solid or liquid? So both of them are liquids. But why don't you wake up tomorrow and say, huh, water is liquid after all. Then you pour water into your car tank and pour petrol into your radiator. It won't work. Am I correct? Why? Because those liquids are liquids, but they have broken ranks. They are in the wrong places. So when you break ranks, you end up being injured. Can I pray for you? You will not get injured in Jesus' name. Maybe the story of this man will help somebody. I know some of us who love football a little will remember this footballer, Etim Essen. 
Can you remember that young man? That man was said to be so, so sharp and smart. They said he would have been better than J.J. Okocha. If not for, for what happened. And you ask me what happened. Nigeria was preparing for the 1987 under 20 World Cup at Chile. They put them in camp. And the coaches were building the team around a team Essen, a young lad. He played for Iwanyawu National. He played for uh, Raka, another Raka Rovers. Very, very talented young man. The coaches said, all you need to do is give the ball to a team Essen. He can do anything with the ball. So they were building the team around him. Whenever they went to training, they would be training with a team Essen on their mind. He was the star of the team. A few days before they traveled for the World Cup, I think barely 10 days or 12 days, a team Essen left the camp. In the dead of the night with some mates, they wanted to go to the club to enjoy themselves. And on their way out, armed robbers attacked and they shot them. He was the only one who was hit. He was not hit on the hand. He was not hit on the palm. He was not hit on the shoulder. He was hit in the thigh. And the bullet lodged itself in the thigh and stayed there. And they had to carry him in a pool of blood. Hey, the man entered into indiscipline. But because of his talents, Nigeria did not mind. Let's forget the indiscipline. Let us treat this man to be well. He's our star. They took him to the hospital. They did all manner of operations. They invited doctors to treat him. A team Essen must go to the World Cup. And indeed, they were able to manage him. He could no longer train. They said, you will get there. You will train before we start our match. A team Essen, you must start. You must play in the World Cup. He got there, not fully fit. Etimessin played, yes. But they said that was the most calamitous World Cup we had ever attended. Since 1983 that we began to go for under 20 World Cup. They beat us mercilessly in all the matches. In spite of Etimessin being there. And football analysts said, this is the story of a man who would have been but did not become. Because he broke ranks. Till today. Those who were progressing and projecting his talent. They said if he continued that way. He will be far better than Austin J.J. Okocha. But he never became. You will become what God has ordained for you. You will not be injured. But the panacea is this. Don't break ranks. Remain in the family. Remain where God has put you. Hey, abide with your vision. Don't do cho 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 cho. Don't run around. And you begin to think I'm talking about Hollywood alone. No. Don't even begin to peep at what other people are doing. What did God send you to do? Remain in your place of calling. Brother Mike, are you saying we should not derive challenges from other ministries? Oh, no, 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 no. What I'm saying is I do not abandon the vision gave to you and begin to run after another man's vision. What he gave to me is different from what he gave to you. What gathers us together is the same umbrella of drama. My operation will be different from yours. All I know is that what he tells me to do, I do. I will not break rank. Tell your neighbor I will not break rank. Number two, hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is another thing that gets a soldier injured. Hypocrisy is false claim or pretense of having a quality that you do not possess. You call it double-facedness. Neither hot nor cold, neither here nor there. So then because thou art neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. The most foolish soldier is the soldier that puts on the green camouflage of his own nation and puts on the uh, brownish camouflage trouser of the other soldier. The top is his own nation. The trouser is the enemy nation. He went to get the uniform by one way or the other. His thinking is that by the time I get to the battleground, nobody will shoot me. My nation will see me. That other nation will see their own trouser on me. And I will end up being free. Of course, that kind of man will get 
I mean, we end up being shot by both armies at the same time. Why? Confusion. So there are a lot of us that are confusing. You are confusing even the angels sent to attend to you in ministry. They don't know where you belong. Are you really in or out? Are you here or there? Are you for us or for them? Where you belong, the angel sent to you does not know. Hypocrisy. And I tell you, the wisest Christian is the one who knows he has a problem, acknowledges he has a problem, and cries unto hope, unto God, help me, Lord. So you must run away from hypocrisy. When something is wrong with you, open your mouth and cry to God. When a Christian is sick, and we tell you, brother, what's wrong with you? What do we normally tell one another? I'm what? I'm strong. Let the weak say, great. Doctrinally good. Wonderful. Superb. I love it. I'm not against it. Correct. I use that terminology too. It's a confession of faith. But beloved, when you sit in front of your medical doctor, when your head is knocking like anything, your body is hot like an oven, your eyes are no longer seeing very well. It's like you fall down. And the doctor says, oh, Mr. Man, you're not looking good. What's the problem? <laughs> I'm strong, sir. Then that person is really sick. Do you tell your medical doctor you are strong? You begin to pour out everything. So this is the way a lot of us behave. When we come to people who can help us, elders in the body of Christ, you say it is well. When it's not well, open your mouth, sir. Something is wrong with my Christian life. My ministry is not moving. I need help. Hold me by the hand, sir. You go before God in your place of, 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 of personal devotion. This is not the time to begin to blast in tongues. I shall rise. I shall be the head and not the tail. No weapon fashioned against me. No, you leave that. Cry, Lord, I need mercy. Mercy is not what I need. Eschew hypocrisy, beloved. When you live in hypocrisy, you end up being injured. You get wounded. Number three, covetousness. This is inordinate desire for possession, especially for wealth. Inordinate desire for possession, especially for wealth, for popularity, for promotion. Inordinate, underline that. You just want it by all means. You remember Gehazi very well. You remember the encounter Elisha had with Elijah. Am I correct? Elisha got a double of Elijah's spirit. And the next person in the house with Elisha was Gehazi. You know the story of Naaman, the way he came to Elisha for his healing? I'm paraphrasing. In the end, he got the healing and they went back to Elijah. Elisha. He said, there is no other God except Jehovah God of Israel. And he offered to Elisha some bits of gifts. And Elisha said, no, no. Go with your gift. I will not receive anything of your hand. And Eli and Naaman said, In that case, can you allow your servant, a servant, to get at least some sand <clears throat> for me to take back home <clears throat> as a covenant that the God of Israel is now my God? He said, Let it be so, you can. And Naaman was saying, What kind of man of God is this? Not our generation before we pray now. You have to drop some money with the secretary of the prophet out there before you enter at all. And lo and behold, Naaman took his journey back home. But then the Bible says of Gehazi, he said, how can my master spear this man to go? He said, I will now run and get somewhat of him. That is, get something from him. He thought he was going to get something. He did not know he was going to end up with leprosy. When you are the spirit of covetousness, what you think you are running after, you may get it, you may not get it, but you certainly get the things you are not running after. That's just the irony about covetousness. So when he caught up, he was running. The Bible says, Naaman saw him running. Perhaps this man had never run an errand for his master like that. By the time he got to Naaman, I guess he was panting heavily. <sighs> Oh God, young prophet, what thing happened now? <laughs> now, my, <coughs> my master, just the time where you come out, you know, tell, now you some young men come from Ephraim, they come visit them. Now my master say, may I run, follow you. Say that the way you won't give them, say make you give me. 
and the thing took away one uh, talent of silver and two garments. Make you give me quick, quick, may I come, come back home? Ah, Naaman was so happy that eventually the man of God will be taking something of me. He said, I'll not give you one talent of silver, I'll give you two plus two changes of garment as you want. And they packed them. And happily, you know what he told him? I don't want you to labor. I can see you are tired. My men will carry them on their head and their donkeys and follow you back home. And that was what they did. They helped him to carry everything. And you know what <laughs> Gehazi was doing? He was walking before them, singing. I have finally arrived. My ministry is blossoming. My breakthrough has come. Hallelujah. Amen. That was the singing, or the song he was singing. So proud and happy that he had arrived. And beloved, there are times when you think you have arrived. The truth is you have started departing. If you are not careful. And when he got back home, he told them, please wait outside. Okay, let's come in now. And they were so happy. Oh, help us. Oh, no, no, don't shout. The master will be sleeping. Now can you be shouting like bushmen? Keep quiet. And he told them, go to the backyard. And they put everything there. He thought he was smart. <laughs> he did not know he was losing his destiny. And he hid everything. He told them, bye-bye. They were shouting again, greet the master, don't shout. And they went. Then we went before the master. He stood before him. And the master said, where have you been? He said, sir, nowhere. I have not left this place. He said, went not my eyes with you? And began to recount everything he did. And he asked a question. He said, is it a time to receive money? Is it a time to receive money? Meaning there is a time to receive money. But beloved, this is not the time. There is a time for that financial breakthrough to come. But why don't you wait for it to come? Don't allow covetousness to truncate your journey onto that place you so much desire. Is it a time? He said, well, the leprosy that fell from the body of Naaman I deposited in a dustbin looking for where I will put it. But now I think there is no need to worry around. Let it come upon you. And from there, the leprosy landed on him. And you know, at that time, lepers are not allowed to live in the city. So he began to live in the back of the city by extrapolation. If we say Elisha got a double of Elijah, then we can assume Gehazi might have got a double of Elijah's own. But then he ended up with leprosy covetousness beloved bid your time in ministry face your vision don't be in a hurry to make it don't be in a hurry to make it to make it to drive the biggest car and when they tell you from glory to glory from glory to glory does not mean you are going from a 2021 Benz to 2023 model of the same Benz this is what we share testimony. Hallelujah. The pastor prophesied from glory to glory. I just changed my car. Hallelujah. I moved from a single day, I mean from a three bedroom bungalow to a mansionette. Hallelujah. I'm moving from glory to glory. No, that's not it. When you read in context what the Bible is talking about that, it has to do with the kingdom. Your accomplishment for, your kingdom, for the kingdom. Your attainment for the kingdom. Your contribution to the kingdom of God. That's what the Bible is saying in context there. So, beloved, run away from covetousness. For the life of a man does not consist in what? In the abundance of things he has. Four, impatience. We are looking at six. And we'll be praying in a short while. Four, impatience. That is restless and intolerant of delays. You are restless. You are not tolerant of delays. You remember the prodigal son? He wanted his own portion of his father's property. He went on to him. I guess this man must have been waiting. When will this man die? He's just growing old. Every morning I expect to meet him dead on the bed. He wakes up and he's hale and hearty. He could no longer wait. And he told him, give me mine and let me go. And of course, that was what happened. You know the end of the story? He confessed on that strange land. He said, and when he came to himself, he said, How many hired of my father have enough to eat and to spear? Here I perish with hunger. You remember that? So a son that was supposed to be well fed at home, out of impatience, ended up in hunger. Impatience. Bid your time in ministry. Don't slag. Don't lag behind God's timetable. Move according to God's time. But bid your time. Don't be in a hurry. And God told me one day, 
He said, son, do you know how, no matter how brilliant a student is, he cannot go into the examination hall before the examination brings the examination paper. Do you understand that? Like you say, you have read the course very well. The thing is now trying to evaporate from your head. You know, at times your head can become hot and heavy. You are just in a hurry for the question paper to be brought. No matter how much you are in a hurry, you may go to the examination hall and sit down. Not until the examiner, uh, the examiner is ready as per the timetable. Nothing will happen. But if you are so much in a hurry, you break into the examiner's office overnight, you grab one of the question papers, you go to the examination hall, 6 a.m. When the paper is bid for 9 a.m., you write it. You are still writing the normal paper. You are not cheating. And you take it and wait for the examination to come. I mean, the examiner to come. As soon as it comes at 9, you tell him, I've put down my own. You know you are in trouble. You've written the correct examination for the correct examiner, but at the wrong time. Bid your time. Be patient. Number five, attack from fellow soldiers. We are looking at just six. Then we pray in a short while. Attack from fellow soldiers. Matthew 26, 48 talks about that man named Judas. Now, he, Judas that betrayed him, gave them a sign. Saying, whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. That's the kiss of an enemy. So soldiers of Christ can be wounded by fellow soldiers. This is a very dangerous and terrible one. In those days, when a sister got pregnant, I'm talking of the days when I became born again. Hey, whenever our brethren heard about it, in tears we cry. Oh, God. Oh, Sister Elizabeth, Lord. Oh, Sister Mercy, Lord. Oh, whatever name we mention in prayers and cry, Lord, have mercy on our sister. We'll be rolling on the ground and be praying for her. But now with chewing gums in our mouth, with relish in our spirit, we discuss it. Oh, do you know that Sister Yetunde is now pregnant? Hey, that sister. Oh, wow. I knew she will eventually get pregnant. The way she does church, church, in fellowship, I knew she will fall. That's the kind of Christianity we have today. Attack from fellow soldiers. There is something we don't allow in my house. When justifiably I or my wife is reporting a fellow minister, a brother to one another, you know what we try to do? The other fellow will try to make excuses for that person. Ah, dear, I don't think he really meant it that way. Maybe it was, you didn't really understand them. And before you know it, the one will help the other to quench the fire. Don't allow animosity around you. I don't know what they are doing in that answer down. What are you getting there? Don't allow anybody to bring that to you. Don't be a party to that. When you want to attack other brethren, help to quench that fire. I get annoyed at times. My dear, it seems you don't understand what I'm telling you. Oh dear, no, no, no. That may not be the real picture. Give him the benefit of the doubt. My wife will be so frustrated at times with members of the women choir she's leading. You know, women are peculiar beings. This woman is giving me hassles. My dear, you are a Christian. You belong to a different order. You belong to a different species. And do as a Christian, let us see the love of Christ in you. I will not be the one to be telling her, look, girl, uh, you're just packers on one side. She's one of the useless. No, no, no. So attack from other brethren. Something happened. A man of God was going, he had been in ministry for some years, but he did not have some property as per a permanent place of worship with a few members of the church. I'm talking of a serious man of God. They were able to raise money to buy, I mean, to some extent, to buy a parcel of land. And the land belonged to a Muslim. Are you still in the house? It belonged to a Muslim. And the Muslim told them the price. He said, I don't know why I'm selling this to you as a Christian, but I just like you. I'll sell it. But the amount they had was not enough. The man gave them time to go and raise the balance. And he was struggling to raise the balance. Doing his best. When eventually the money was complete, he came back to that Muslim man and he said to him, here we are, the money is complete, Alaji. And the Muslim man said, you are welcome. He said, another pastor came. 
and the pastor offered when i told him the price and somebody was going to buy it was trying to raise the money the pastor said you will be giving me times three of what you want to pay i told the pastor that it's another pastor like you that wants to buy it and the man is struggling for months now to get the balance the pastor said i should forget that pastor that he will pay me times three to buy the same parcel of land for his church pastor to pastor and you know what this muslim man said he said i have told him i will not sell the land to him i will reserve it for you but i want to beg you pastor be careful of your fellow pastors that's a muslim man counseling a pastor to be careful of another pastor <laughs> attack from fellow brethren some brethren have been permanently wounded by brethren in christ but your healing is coming tonight some have been wounded by fellow brethren by words of mouth by actions your healing is coming tonight attack from fellow brethren some of you would have heard me tell the story of a man that belonged to a church, a very strong church. I won't mention the name. He got married to a sister in the same church. You know, when you see the sister, you know this is a child of God. No hearing, no nothing, no nothing. Look at just, you know this is a child of God. They got married and began to bear children. But he discovered that his work was not going well. He was laboring. Things were not falling in place. Then he decided he, went to, he was going to fast to find out why I'm doing my best in my chosen career. Things are not just working. I'm telling you of what I know, not in a movie, not in a book. I know the brother, I know the name, know everything. And he went into fasting. God revealed to me. And eventually, he got the revelation. And the revelation was that the wife had an issue. And God emboldened him to ask the wife. He invited the wife to the room and he said, Dear, why is my life not progressing? What do you know about it? And he didn't know when he asked the next question. Dear, who are you? He said, the woman, they both sat on the bed, smiled. He said, you want to know me? You've never asked this question. I will show you who I am. He said, the woman got up from the bed. He went to the middle of the room. She went on all fours and right before his eyes, the woman turned into a lion in the room. I'm not telling you of a movie. And you, and you will see very soon. <laughs> I know the house in Eloni where they lived. <laughs> and she turned back into a woman, into the wife again. She smiled. Have you now known me? Or you still want to really know me? The man said he didn't know where I got the boldness from. He said, I want to know you, dear. He said the woman climbed on the bed. She called there and she turned into a big python before his very eyes. And there like that, she turned into a woman again. Got up. Have you known me? Do you still want to know me? Before he could answer yes. The woman got up again and right before his eyes, the woman was short, black. She turned into a very, very beautiful, fair-skinned lady with long hair and was moving around the room. And right from there, she turned into a very, very aged woman. Very, very old woman without teeth in her mouth. Just walking like that. And then she turned into herself again. I'm talking of attack from brethren. And the man came to tell me that he wanted to divorce his wife. He told me everything. And I laughed. I said, bro, you just formed all this because you want to divorce your wife. You can't deceive me with stories. Why are you lying against this young, innocent lady? Why? He said, sir, let me invite her. He invited her. She sat before me. Repeat everything you said. He did. And I asked her, is it true? She said, yes, sir. <laughs> and then I began to look. I'm talking of attack from brethren. So brethren, there are people with whom you last. That are just not happy with what is happening in your life. Every of their desire and thought for your life and ministry. Such is truncated today in the name of Jesus Christ. Attack from fellow soldiers. So I told him what your wife needs is deliverance. And she told me how she ended up with that power right from a young age. 
Did she become born again? Yes. But she needed deliverance. Are you with me? She confessed Christ. She knew. She said she, she was not happy that there was a day she even caused an accident on her husband's motorbike that almost broke his leg around the central bank area of Ilori. She said she caused it. She didn't know what was pushing her. So there are brethren that just delight in your fall. You begin to wonder, Brother Mike, why are you using brethren? I know what I'm saying. God will deliver us from them. Am I now telling you to begin to suspect brethren? No, leave suspicion. What you need is to fortify yourself with the power of the Holy Ghost. Are you still in the house? And finally, how soldiers are wounded is carelessness. Not giving sufficient attention for you to avoid harm. When you don't give sufficient attention for you to avoid harm. Carelessness. You remember the story of Samson very well. I won't go through it. You know how this man got a wife at Timnat? As against divine instruction, he went up to, Ma, I mean, to sleep with an allot in Gaza until he ended up with Delilah in Sorek. And Delilah was the final buster. And you know the way he was playing games with the anointing upon his life. When you become careless as a soldier of Christ, you'll be wounded. He told lies after lie, playing the game of Ludo with the anointing upon his life. Eventually, he told him the air on my head. There are seven locks there. Seven locks. If you bind me, I mean, if you cut them off, I'll become as another man. And I don't know what the seven locks stood for. But I think one stood for justification, another one for consecration, another one for dedication, another one for anointing, another one for integrity, another one for zeal. I don't know what they also, but they stood for something. The ear locks were cut off. The Bible says something got up as at other times. You know what it means? As he had always gotten up. But the Bible goes on to say that he wished not, W-I-S-T, he knew not that the power had left him. He thought he was still the same. He did not know he had lost it. He shook himself and he was wondering, what's wrong with me? I'm not feeling the way I normally feel. That's why your place of prayer, personal devotion, the unction doesn't come again. You pray for three minutes, you're out. Ten minutes, you're out. You want to sing, sing praises, you see it's not flowing. You want to read the Bible, no inspiration. You sit down to write a script, things are not happening again. He wished not that the Spirit of God had left him. And in the end, the enemies came to grab him and they removed his eyes that is they put an end to his physical vision they bound him they put an end to his freedom and they put him in prison they put an end to his liberty and uh, an anointed man of god became an abused prisoner of lust began to grind corn in the prison of the enemies he got wounded he got injured but well, blessed be god there is healing for every injury. I thought you say amen. amen. Please let's open to Matthew 12 20. We'll be reading this and close in a few minutes. Matthew 12 20. A bruised reed, that's KJV first. A bruised reed, uh huh. Shall he not break? And smoking flax, shall he not quench? A bruised reed. Shall he not break a smoking flax? Shall he not quench? Let me explain a bruised reed. A reed is a kind of plant that grows beside waterways. They are usually very fragile. But when there is water, they look green and strong. When dry season comes, you see them drying up and then breaking. So when they break before they fall, they get bruised. You see the mark on them that they are fragile. They can break any time. They are wounded by environmental factors. They are wounded by circumstances. They are wounded by situations around them. But a bruised reed with our God, the Bible says he will not break. He will rather tend it back into life. You are injured. He's not interested in abandoning you. He's willing to heal you and bring you back again. The Bible says, a smoking flax, it shall not quench. What is a flax? A flax is like a wick, W-I-C-K. A thread 
that you normally put in the bush lamp our mothers used to use in the olden days with oil inside to give them fire i mean lights illumination in the village markets night markets then so the wick you put inside is the flax f-l-a-x this is what we soak oil and then you put fire when the oil is drying you discover that the flax will get dried up it forms charcoal and then instead of bringing illumination it brings out smoke that is what you call a smoking flax the best thing for you to do is to quench it for it not to trouble your eyes and trouble your nose you quench it but the bible is saying a smoking flax will he not quench it will rather blow you back to flame it will tend you you are injured yes but he's ready he's willing he doesn't want you to go like that he's here with his healing balm tonight at that very point where you are hacking, where you are in pain where things are not going on well you know it as i am speaking now you are saying yourself brother mike i understand the holy spirit is amplifying my voice in your ears you know the point where you are wounded where things are not just going on well you are a bruised reed you are ready to go to break off but it will not break you you are a smoking flux others will quench you but it will not quench you the nlt says it will not crush those who are weak or quench the smallest hope until he brings full justice and his final victory president please come a bruised reed it will not break a smoking flax it will not quench beloved like the prodigal son please. like the prodigal son the bible says and when he came to himself he said i will arise the next verse says and he arose and two verses after that the bible says and he came to his father and five things happened when he came to his father his father saw him his father had compassion on him the father ran to him the father fell on him the father kissed him so the man took only one step he came to the father the father took five steps because he's a loving father the boost read he will not break the smoking flax he will not quench and remember this is that destiny that has been wounded please hold it with one hand up like that hold this with the other hand under it i think we can see that when you come before the altar and you cry to the master father i need your help my destiny is sick and you pour the water of life into it in the place of prayer crying for mercy lord have mercy on me help me i'm ready to do a restitution i'm crying for forgiveness before your very life before your very eyes you see your life turn around you see every dirty and obscure destiny become clear this is the hand of god at work in this place tonight this is what daddy is ready to do for you as you go before god in prayers just keep talking to him now bow your head kneel down stand up lie on the floor do whatever you want in a few minutes we begin to cry unto him lord please put it down here am i help me here am i help me as the lord of somebody here am i Help me, Lord. Here am I. Help me. Here am I. Help me. 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 Family, heal my wounded ministry. Hey, hey, hey. Somebody, ah, help, help me, help me, Lord. Here am I, help me. Yeah. 
to see Jesus. Sit upon the throne. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Do it again. Lava Katam Palegria Kata. Father, do it again in my life. I am injured. Do it again in my life. Hey. the keyboard alone go ahead solemnly we have come to the hospital of the Holy Ghost you want to bring yourself like the prodigal son to the emergency world of the Holy Ghost you know you have been wounded you have been shattered you have been battered in one place or the other in an area of your life you know you need help you want to bring yourself to the emergency world of God Lord I need help why don't you rise and come before the altar now? You know your case is an emergency, Lord. I just need help. Let the keyboard go ahead. Just play that. Seated mm -hmm. upon the throne. Go ahead and talk to him before the altar. Holy Ghost. Do it again. Ah. Mercy is what I need. Yeah. 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 Savior, Savior, one more time. Ah, Savior, 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 ah, Savior. Savior, I, I have to cry. 